December 7th, 1941, Sunday afternoon. We have witnessed this morning a battle off Pearl Harbor. Football season was over at F&M and I went, I hitchhiked from Lancaster back to Pittsburgh and I was someplace between uh, the exit after Somerset and Harrisburg when I heard about it. I was working for a bus company and uh, I was going from one company to another when I heard the news. I was on my way to a girlfriend's house, it was her birthday, and I heard it on the radio. Uh, I was a student up at uh, St. Vincent Prep. Well, the priest came in and said, Pearl Harbor has just been bombed. We thought, where the hell is Pearl Harbor? I had never even heard of Pearl Harbor. I must have heard of it, but I didn't know where it was. I had no idea what it would mean to the whole world. We saw on the uh, news and the movie news and things like that and also the newspapers about the terrible thing that took place there. So that's what, in my situation, that's what started the war because then my number was called up in the draft, so I was drafted. I read in the paper one day that uh, the Navy was looking for women and for college graduates and you could walk right in with a commission. You didn't have to go to uh, boot camp or whatever they called it then. So I left uh, Penn State in November and uh, came to Pittsburgh, went down to the post office and went to the Marine Corps recruiters, I guess, and told them I wanted to join the Marine Corps. I was trying to get into the Air Cadets, and by the time I, I went to the Air Cadets, uh, they were full. So they said, well, you have to pick the Army, Navy, or Marines, you know. So I thought, well, if I'm going to fight for my life, I'm joining the Marines. I was going to join the Marine Corps or the Navy. My mother wouldn't let me go because she wanted me, if I died, I'd be, they'd find me on a battlefield. <laughs> so I had the priest on her sign the papers, and I joined the Navy on June 15, 1942. Went to the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and that's where I caught my USS Cleveland, 610 feet long, 10,000 ton ship. On the 3rd of uh, January, we were shipped right out into Tennessee where we'd raise the training bus. And we were picked to, and we were considered a special outfit, which meant, meant a lot to us in a sense, because we were a little bit different from the rest of the people, like the infantry or whatever else. But even though we did have to go through a rifle range training and whatever else, how to shoot and have a gun. A Tommy gun. I went down to uh, Camp Wheeler, Georgia, and then from Camp Wheeler, I went up to uh, Camp Pick. A carbine. Um, with the drill instructors, it could be pretty difficult at times. Then there's this Tarzan technique. He's because the Marine Corps is noted for being riflemen. Everyone is mm -hmm. a rifleman. Mm -hmm. And so they let you alone. They didn't hassle you. Mm -hmm. But when you got back to the regular base, you were hassled again until you were finished and graduated. I graduated from Fort Sill with my commission and traveled the country doing a lot of different training on, on the guns. I wanted to go overseas like everybody else was doing, but they kept shuffling me, shuffling me off to different camps. Finally, I left for the, for the Philippines. The Women's Army Corps is an integral part of the Army of the United States and its members who are soldiers in every sense of the word. Our company, would uh, we would drive tugs loaded with supplies and stuff. That was one of my jobs in the service. There were potholes in the, in the, in the ground, on the dirt, and as you would um, run over them, you'd bounce and bounce, and most of the girls quit. 
but I, I seem to be a toughie. I was a 388th bomb group, and that's where we flew out of. First mission was in uh, end of November, 43. It was pretty exciting because you didn't know what to expect. Everybody asked how, if I shot any planes down, and I tell them we flew in groups of 18 in a group. And when a plane came in toward the end, there was 17 other fellows shooting at that plane coming in. So the, the group would get credit. morning of June 6th, this was the battleground. This is D-Day. My job was in a brigade. It was a special brigade of engineers. And my job was as a rifleman. But anyway, I seen a second wave of paratroopers coming in. It's all on Utah Beach. From left to right, all I can see was parachutes. It scared me half to death. We had, uh, we were due at 6.30, but we were, uh, it was around two o'clock before we were able to land. Water, oh, they dumped us off the water up to our necks. And uh, we had one guy that was short, so was short that somebody had to, carry, had to carry him to the shore. And once we got there, uh, we lost like about 15,000 men. And plus they are walking across the Germans and Americans on the beach. It was so heavily mined. Well, I, I, I landed D plus two. So it was two days later that we landed. We were up in a valley in a farmer's yard. That's where I was digging a foxhole and I got hit by machine gun ball. Just like a match head, went in, Launched me in the back of the head. Like a little piece of mat match head. And probably still in there, I don't know. Maybe I combed it out. Who knows? You know? There's things that happen on D Day that a lot of people don't know. For example, the Air Corps missed our beach. They were supposed to lay 70 tons of bombs. And the bombs. They missed our beach altogether. And the thing that hurt us the most, once we did get beyond the barbed wire, hedgerows, worst thing in the world. I think most of the men in our outfit, well, most of the men was in combat, wasn't worried about dying. They worried more about their people back home than themselves. I know that's the way I felt. The American front lines had advanced to Guam and Saipan. Ahead now stood Iwo Jima, the most heavily fortified island in the world. As soon as we started up the hill, we got fire from the top of the hill. And we had to just stay. We all got flat. Uh, there was a clump of bushes. And I told some guys, get, guy, get behind the bush. I don't know what the hell that was going to do for them, but they did. So I had some guys over there, and then uh, one guy was, he was right beside me. His head was knocked off, mine wasn't. That's tough. So we were supposed to go into Munich. And at that time, and at that point, a lot of the buildings had been bombed out and stuff. And so there weren't a whole lot of big battles, but there were from time to time, you know. But they told our commander there, Colonel Sparks, swing on down there instead of going right into Munich, swing on there to Dachau. We were hardened soldiers. We had seen a lot of people. We've seen people die. We've seen people wounded and everything. But when we saw that, we could not understand. That was a terrible place. The guys that we saw were just uh, stripped down. Some were naked. There were men, women, children. 
There were over 2,000 bodies on those rail cars. Uh, Winter people saw that. A lot of the guys cried. They started crying. A lot of them vomited. And many of us did both. Because we never could imagine human beings treating somebody else that badly, you know. Every once in a while, if I think about it, I can get that smell up in my nostrils. You, you never forget about that. Yes, I'm far from home, and skies seem gray. Why did I roam so far, far away? Well, my country called, and I heeded the cry. I love her so, that for her I would die. This comes from the heart of a boy in blue. From the heart of a boy who will fight till it's through. Wrote that at 17 years of age. <laughs>